lasts this long if my wrist starts like you know <laughs> faltering. <laughs> That's a good idea. <coughs> testing, testing. <laughs> Needs to be quite high for Paul. From the ceiling. Prepared. In this village. So, oh, I, I wasn't expecting you to film it. Oh, what just happened to have this? <laughs> totally unexpected. <laughs> yeah, I've got to do something like that. What? I was going for a bit of height. I get your head in like this. Rock and roll, Paul. Sweet. Is it level? Well, 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 under that side, pack it up. Is that it? It's feeling pretty good. Okay. Yeah, I might wedge it. Just, just you know, you're still, you're still on it. Yeah. yeah. You know, try not to. Oh, oh, look at that, look at that. I can almost see your shoes. We're going to have to take a beer break every time. Can, can someone check? Can someone check? Okay. Hi. 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 Hi talk for big questions, the idea is that you answer some big questions. Um, you don't use uh, any kind of holy books or anything like that or any kind of received wisdom, it's purely on a kind of scientific rationalist basis. Um, and you try and uh, start with questions that people consider to be unanswerable, and then you try and work out what the actual answers to those questions are. So to give you an example uh, of such a question, there's the famous question of course, about the universe, uh, out of the chicken and the egg. Now, this thought's been unanswerable, because whatever it is you say, the other person says, oh, but then, and then they go back and say, you say it's the egg, they say, well, it's the egg. If you say it's the chicken, uh, they say, what did the chicken come out of? The actual answer, if you want to know, to what came first, either the chicken and the egg, is that the egg comes first. So, you've heard it here first, and the way it works is like this. Imagine that we have a, a dinosaur, like this, and then 65 million years later, through the evolutionary process, we have a chicken like this. Now this bird is unarguably a chicken, it's one of those red boiler birds that you get cheaply from the supermarket. Uh, this creature here is unarguably a dinosaur, um, theropod dinosaur. And as uh, evolution progresses between these two species, it's going to become less and less like a dinosaur, and more and more like a chicken. Now at some point, People are going to start arguing about whether the thing is a chicken yet. And there's probably going to be a gap of, I don't know, like 100,000 years or something, um, where scientists can't agree on whether or not the fossil that they have is a fossil of a chicken or a fossil of the chicken's evolutionary predecessor. But the point is it doesn't matter, because every single creature that goes along the 65 million year timeline comes out of an egg. The egg is a constant. Wherever you go, that animal, that animal, that animal, that animal, they all came out of an egg. So what happens is, the creature, which is almost a chicken, so close to being a chicken that to, to look at, they'd be indistinguishable, uh, either through sexual reproduction or through mutation at the zygotic stage, um, produces an egg out of which a creature that's very slightly different from it uh, emerges. Um, scientists bestow the title of chicken on that creature. So the egg comes first, and if anybody says, well, what laid the egg? The answer to that is it's the chicken's immediate evolutionary predecessor, 
and that's the actual answer to the question uh, of what came first, chicken and egg. So the answer is egg. Thank you very much. So there you go. <laughs> that's that dealt with. Um, I'm going to move on to slightly more choppy waters now. Uh, trying to find out what the uh, scientific rationalist answer is to the, uh, the rather more thorny question of uh, is there a God? Oh dear. AK. Okay. Is there a God? Now, this is a question that's occurred to mankind ever since the dawn of time. Um, Some of you might ask why I think there's any real reason why we should be able to square away now. Um, but I think that we're actually in a good time for squaring away the question of is there a God um, for reasons that hopefully will become clear. But before I go on to talking about whether there's a God or not, I have to tell you guys about something that I've got into recently, uh, which is the geometry of bouncing balls. I really like throwing balls at a wall, as a lot of people do, and then catching them again. And you can get to a stage where it's almost a kind of zen-like calmness. The ball always comes back to your hand, back to your hand, back to your hand. Tom, how you doing, man? <laughs> the people have a lot of time in their hands, like students or unemployed people. They can play this game in a more kind of in-depth way. So they try and bounce the ball on objects, onto another object, onto a cup. And I'm sure you've all seen videos online of people doing that with the ball. They're landing in the cup. It's very impressive. Now, I've been practicing this. And five quid says... Five quid says that I can bounce that ball off that back wall onto this table and into the uh, into a cup. So would anybody like to take me on on that bet? Come on, don't sit there. You, there's no way. Oh, you mean bet against me, <laughs> saying you can't do it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, I say that I can do it, and you <laughs> say I bet with you. Can we all bet against you? We can all bet against you. There's only one five. You can only have one game. Are you saying, are you saying you one? How many attempts do you get? Just one. Okay. So it hits the back wall first. It then hits a number of other places, but it ends up landing. Including Abby. Yeah. Well, whatever. <laughs> No, no, I didn't factor you guys in because you weren't here when I was practicing this afternoon. Uh, but it will land in a cup. So, uh, everybody believe that? Or are happy with that? I you believe promise. it. Do you believe it? Does anybody not believe I it? I don't believe it. You don't believe it. Okay, does anyone else not believe it? I suspect none of you believe it. In which case, I would say to you, how do you, uh, how do you answer this little sucker? Yeah? How's that? There it is, just as I said. I bounced it in there this afternoon. It shows that I can do it off the back wall, off the table, and, uh, and into the jar. I think it'll be pretty impressive. <laughs> cough up, Abby, cough up. Yeah, <laughs> my, my, my <laughs> no. She's not coughing up. She's not paying. <laughs> Abby, why are you paying? I don't carry cash. You don't carry cash. Don't <laughs> well, <clears throat> hands up, he thinks I'm telling the truth. In case you benefit the film, it's none of them. But that raises a question. So if, I was, if I didn't, if I didn't throw it back wall, wait. If I didn't throw it back wall, how did it end up in the cup? You put it in the cup. Okay, Abby says I put it in the cup. Um, does anybody else think I made you put it in the cup? I think you tried and then rolled it in. You think I tried and rolled it in? <laughs> okay. In a bit of a I think salt. Josh put it in the cup. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Josh put it in the cup. Okay, there's a number of other options here. Um, right, fine. Well, I say I threw it in. I'm sticking to that, and I consider this issue one of the time. So, back in the pocket. So I say, I threw it in. Abby says, I put it in. Right. I say, Josh put it in. You say, Josh put it in. All right, well, I'll tell you something. It's definitely one of those two. Okay, there is no third option. It was definitely one of those two. Um... And without trying to humour me in any way, uh, hands up who, who agrees with Abby that I probably put it in before today's show. <laughs> I, I, I suppose if it's a play on words, I think you might have thrown it into the cup like that, which is different. No, no, it's, it's no play on words, it's as I described okay. it. Okay. So, do you think... I, I, I will go if you put it in. Okay, so you... I reckon I could do it. You reckon yeah. I could do it? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm pretty possible. I, I, I'd give myself more than 50-50 doing it. Okay. <laughs> So how many attempts? One. I think okay. I do it straight away as well. I think I'll bounce. Do it. I wouldn't People get it think bouncing. I'm arrogant. Can we get it? If it's bouncing around the room, then it's, it's going to be a lot harder. But if you just do it off a wall, then it's going to be quite easy. The viewers would love it if you had a go. Can yeah. I have a go? Well, yeah, go on then. Let's do it. Put Abby's in the way. Because then we'll know really how we'll like it. I don't, I don't recall you giving us any caveats, Jez. <laughs> Can I have a cup? 
It has to be off the back wall. Well, no. It's can I hold the cup? No, it's got to be. Oh, no, no, no. I meant ah. can you hold the cup. Oh, wait, so, so far as you just throw it in? No, no you you throw it against the wall. And I can catch it in the cup. cup. Anyway, this isn't going to be. This is it. Go on then. Off the back wall. Yeah. My kid at the same pretend. Maybe 50 50. That reminds me of a comment I once heard. If somebody says you're not as good as you think you are, and the person responds, no one's as good as I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> right. But actually, Jez is making an interesting point. And the interesting point that Jez is making is that there is actually a way in which I can convince you that I've done it. And what would that be? Shame us. Yeah, I'd have to do it again, right? If I was like, AK okay, fine, and threw the ball out, and bang off the back wall, and it landed back in the cup, you'd be far more likely to believe that I'd done it the first time around. If you can repeat the experiment, people tend to believe it, and it doesn't matter how ridiculous the premise is, and you can show them that it can be done, and that you can do it, then they'll buy it. And that's actually a really important thing, because the ability to repeat an experiment... Repeat a low chance. The ability to repeat an experiment over and over again is the scientific model. The difference between something which is scientific and unscientific isn't um, depending on whether the guy's wearing a lab coat, it depends on whether or not it can be tested by the experiment and whether the experiment can be repeated over and over again you know, with the same uh, parameters and comes up with the same result. So repeating an experiment essentially makes something science. If you have something where the experiment obstinately refuses to repeat, you're in the world may believe, and that's basically the difference. So anyway, what's well, something that can be challenged? Fun. Something that can be challenged or disproven? Yeah, something well disproven if you if you repeat the experiment with the exact parameters and it doesn't work, then I guess it's disproved. Uh, you probably do it a couple of times just to rub it in. Um, right. So here we go. So Abby says I put it in. You've all put your hands up and said that you agree with Abby, but uh, I don't really understand. We've only got two options. Um, and they're both possible, so I was kind of expecting more of a 50-50 a, a split from you guys. Um, why do you all think I put it in rather than threw it in? Because it seems unlikely. It seems unlikely, okay. So, uh, insofar as it's more probable. From your own experience. Okay. Your own mind. From my perception, it's, it's the, the way you told the story. It didn't sound like it was possible. It didn't sound right. It didn't sound right. Okay, well... Generally speaking, what people say is that uh, it, it's less probable. It's the same possibility, either it is one or zero, you either can or can't do it. They could both be done, but it's unlikely. So what do we think is the probability that I put the ball in the cup? Any suggestions? I haven't admitted it yet. <laughs> Abby, you questioned me first. Um, I would say it's pretty close to 100. You say it's pretty close to 100. Okay, so what would you say, 99.9? Yeah, I would say Tom? Sorry, I've just realised that you probably spent an hour trying to do it and then finally did it. Um, no, so no, I, 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 I'm going back on my put it in. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'll just stop heckling in a minute. Yeah, just realised. Uh, any, any guesses? What's the probability of putting it in as opposed to? It's got to be at least 99 point okay. something. All right, fine. So we're, we're talking like we're talking. Let's say just 99 percent to save you writing any more than we have been. Um, which would mean I'm not sure if I'd set a sign of probability at all, though. You want a sign of probability to it? Then how do you make a decision? Just like flip a coin. Most people tend to assign probabilities to things. Whether or not you want to, you'll immediately do it. You'll be like, I don't believe that, I do believe that. Your brain will do it for you generally. Um, which I guess, because these things are this way, that leaves whatever's left as a possibility they threw it in. So if we've got a line of probability going on like that, that's 100, that's zero. You say that the chances that I put it in there and the chances that I put it in there. Now, if I were to fess up and say, okay, okay, I, I lied, I feel bad, I did put the ball in the cup, could you then be absolutely certain that I put it in the cup? No. Why not? Because you could be lying. I could be lying. You'd be more certain though, right? Yeah. So, okay, so we're starting to split this last 1% of it. So we're a little more certain because I've said that I put it in. So now I'm going to do a lie detector test, and I do the lie detector test, and I say, best I put it in, and the lie detector test says you did indeed <coughs> put it in. Can you then be certain? No. No, why not? Because the lie detector test didn't go on. Because the lie detector school. test didn't go on. Yes, yes. I mean, everybody needs to answer these questions. You've got to... Anyway, so the lie detector test can be wrong. So, what we're finding is that even with something as obvious as me putting a ball in a cup uh, rather than throwing it in from over there, um, you can be pretty sure, but you can never be completely sure. 
And so this raises a question, which is how do we manage to uh, how do we manage to make decisions? Why aren't we paralysed by indecision if we can't be 100 percent sure of anything? And the truth is, you really can't. You might be one of the 6,000 people in the world who are currently in a perpetual vegetative state, and I'm just a figment of your imagination, and that's the nature of your life. Now, for those people, that's what they've got. I'm sure they think it's real, but it isn't. But what happens is, you have 50-50, which is the point at which most people don't make a decision. But as you move away from 50-50, you can be more and more certain of a thing, or more and more certain that the thing is really true. Now, if you're a very decisive person, you'd have what I call fulcrum of belief about here. So as soon as you get to 60-40, you make the decision. And you say, right, okay, um, yeah, I'm going to act on that. And as soon as you pass this tipping point, as soon as you've got enough evidence to go past the tipping point, you carry on with your life as though it's certain, and you don't hedge your bets. If you're not a very decisive person, you might find that your fulcrum of belief, your tipping points are a little further apart. You're one of these people who likes to ruminate endlessly on things and like consider every possible angle before you make a move. And people like that can be a little bit... Boring. You're on 51, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's your, where is your fulcrum? Yeah. <laughs> <middle. laughs> <laughs> so, so what you'll find is that people who, you know, who are really good at kind of like jobs where you process information and stuff like that, you know, they have fulcrum which is a little wider apart. So Laura would be somebody with wider fulcrum. She needs to be absolutely certain and then she'll say something, which means that when she says something, you'll be pretty sure it's true. Um, but that... Uh, she might say things or give you advice less than you might like. And then if you're manically depressed, you'll find that your fulcrum of belief are out here somewhere. No matter how much evidence there is that a thing's a good idea, or it's going to benefit you, you just fixate on this remaining doubt. And you're like, oh, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But the problem is that being sure isn't actually possible. There's another funny thing about the fulcrum of belief, which is that it tends to move around depending on what you're thinking about. So let's say that... Uh, Alistair's an investor and liar. He's never told me the truth in his life. And uh, Jeremy comes up to me and he says, you know, Alistair, I think he lied to me about something. I'd be like, fucking shit, sure, right, he lied to you. He's the worst bloke on God's earth. He lies about everything. I would immediately believe Jez, literally just because he told me that he was thinking that Alistair had lied to him. If, on the other hand, Alistair was a stand-up guy and he never told me a lie in his life and Jez says, I think Alistair lied to me, I'd be like, well, I, I don't know, Jez. I mean, like, are you sure you're not... You know, you're sure you're not just seeing something that isn't there. So with the same prompt, I think Alistair lied to me, I can believe it or not believe it, because these my folk tend to move around based on previous experience. Now, if we're going to be scientific, we're going to be rationalists without answering the question of is there a God, we've got to watch out for doing something like this. Which is if, for instance, you grew up in a, you know, a Muslim household or something, you know, died in a war Muslim, and you, know, you love your religion, you put your folk of belief there, and there. And you say, I am a Muslim. And unless you can prove to me 100% that my beliefs are wrong, I'm not going to change them. And you say, oh, well, you know, like, I'm not going to, don't come and get me, I'm not saying there are any reasons to believe there's no such thing as Allah. But anyway, if you were to give him some reasons, he would say, aha, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, and he would fixate on whatever doubt was remaining. Because you can't prove it, 100% of course, because 100% proof isn't really available, and so the person digs themselves into this faith position. Christians do it, and in truth, atheists do it as well. They say, this is the kind of person that I am, and unless you can prove to me that I'm wrong, then I'm not going to you know, I'm not gonna change the way I think. And you say, well, you know, there are reasons to believe. And you go, yeah, yeah, but what about, yeah, but what about, and what about, and you, and you're not being balanced. You're trying to maintain a position by fixating on the remaining doubt as opposed to kind of having a clear mind and just doing it on a straight up as a probability. So the first thing you have to do, if you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to make a rational decision, if you're trying to be as rational as you can, is you have to try and adopt this position, a position of not caring either way what the answer is. You then have to, as well as you possibly can, assign uh, the theories that you're given a probability and then you have to be really strict if it turns out that one of them is more likely than the other. And you say, well, that's going to be my position from now on, unless more evidence emerges one way or the other. I'm not going to be here or here and have to be dragged kicking and screaming. I'm going to start off here and go wherever the evidence seems to lead me, and that's the scientific rational approach. The other thing you must do, and this is a really big no-no, it really gets on my nerves, is that people use uh, a phenomena 
as proof. So, for instance, I would say, how did the ball end up in the cup? Not in the cup, well, there you go. So, how did the ball end up in the cup? And then I say I threw it in, and Abby says that I put it in. We it's saw that. You put it in. Yeah, I put it in there. <laughs> and somebody else says, no, it's quite clear that this is a kind of uh, shellfish that lives in the air rather than the water, and it forms uh, the glass. Uh, out of materials from the tabletop, and that this is the equivalent of a pearl that forms around a grip that's landed inside of it. And you say, okay, and what makes you think that? And they say, it's right there. What more proof do you need? And I know that sounds like a ridiculous thing to say, but if, for instance, somebody comes up with a theory of how the universe uh, came to be, or how life came to be, and the most obvious one is life, life on planet Earth, you might say it's very unlikely that there's any life on planet Earth, at which point somebody goes, but, 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 and you go, yes, you go, but we're here. You go, yes, we're here, but that doesn't prove your premise, especially if there are two premises. Essentially, you can come up with any reason that you like for life being around on planet Earth, but as long as it ends up with life on planet Earth at the end, you can then use life on planet Earth as your proof. It's the kind of, my cow has been cursed by a powerful witch. I'm not sure that's true. My cow is dead. What more proof do you need? You see? And you basically use the event that's occurred, which you're trying to explain as the quote unquote proof of your theory. You can't do that. So you don't do that. Right. I was going to say, Paul. Yes. What we could do is we could, like, Go stop home. the video. Yeah. And then start it again so it's in chunks in case, like. It, it will be. <laughs> no, so, so I stop it now and then just now, yeah, because you, you'll need to do it in chunks anyway. It needs yeah. to be in chunks to be loaded. Okay. And then if it suddenly stops working, it'd, it'd be sad that. to lose, you know. We're running at 21 minutes. Christ.